In the previous video, and if you haven't seen that yet, you should definitely watch that first, I explained what best response diagrams are. And best response diagrams had this nice feature that we could identify Nash equilibria by finding a pair of points that touch all the labels. Now, to get to the Lemke-Hausen algorithm, we will have to investigate how we can actually find such a pair of points. And what Lemke-Hausen does, it doesn't work directly with these best response diagrams. It works in what's called a best response polytope. And to explain these best response polytopes, I'm using the same example that I used in the last video. And we are drawing a similar picture, uh, the best response diagram for player one. And you remember this looked like this. We had the strategy simplex of player two, uh, which was just a line because player two only has two strategies. And then we uh, depict the expected payoff for player one for each of the three strategies that player one has. What I'm now interested in is this area above the upper envelope of those three lines. And let's call this H. And this is called the best response polyhedron. We can describe this set H, uh, this best response polyhedron, algebraically. So we have the set H and the elements of H are a combination of three numbers, y4, y5, and v, where v will be the payoff from now on. And we know that all the points in H have to lie above this line that corresponds to expected payoff that player 1 gets when playing strategy 1. So what are the properties of these points above that line? Well, just that V has to be large enough. I mean, simply saying, just looking at the picture, we can say V has to be bigger than 3. But more generally, we can say that V should be larger than the expected payoff that player 1 gets when playing strategy 1. So what's the expected payoff when player 1 plays strategy 1? It's three times the probability of player 2 playing strategy 4, which is Y4, so three times Y4, plus three times the probability of player 2 playing strategy 5, which is y5. So we have three times y4 plus three times y5. And v should be at least as large as that. So that's uh, all the points that lie above this first line. And then we have the second line that corresponds to the second strategy of player 1. And we have a similar thing here. We are looking for points that lie above that line. So we have the condition that v should be bigger than what? 2 times y4 plus 5 times y5. And v should be at least as large as that. This all comes out directly from the payoff matrix of player 1. And then lastly, we have the third line. And all the points also should lie above that. Right? We can see that all the points on h lie above that line as well. And so we have this third condition, which is 0 times y4, this is just 0, plus 6 times y5. And v should be at least as big as that as well. And lastly, of course, um, we have conditions for v4 and v5. So first, uh, those are probabilities, so they shouldn't be negative. So both of those values should be 0. And also because they are probabilities, we have that uh, they should sum up to 1. And this describes this set H. And we see that we used to describe the set H using three numbers rather than two. So actually these points live in a three-dimensional space. And we can also draw it in that three-dimensional space. And so we take a three-dimensional coordinate system. We have y4, y5, and v. And the first thing we notice is that y4 and y5 have to sum up to 1. So all the points in this set H somehow must lie above this diagonal 
connecting this value where y5 is 1 and y4 is 0 and where y4 is 1 and y5 is 0. And they can be non-negative, so they really must be above that line and not some extension of that line. And so now we just draw the entire picture on top of this. So it's the same thing as before, but now embedded into three-dimensional space. What will be important for the Lemke-Hausen algorithm is uh, the way in which these different labels touch. So we can see that label 1 has a point in common with label 2. They touch at that point. And label 2 touches label 3 at a different point. But for example, label 1 and label 3, they do not touch at any point. And we want to maintain this relative relationship between these different labels. But we want to ignore the precise payoff that uh, results from a particular strategy. And so what we do is a algebraic trick in a way. Um, we have this condition that y4 and y5 have to sum up to 1. And what we will now do is we will remove that condition and instead require that v is equal to 1. You can think of this as simply dividing everything by v. So all these inequalities, instead of v on the right-hand side, we'll just have 1 on the right-hand side. But y4 plus y5 will sum up to 1 divided by v instead of 1. And this is known as the unit payoff projection. And it will become clear why when we draw this object in this picture. So what we do is we take a horizontal plane uh, at v equals 1 and then we project this uh, polyhedron, the set H, onto that plane. And what we get is a different object that we call Q. And this is exactly the object that I just described. So we just have two numbers now, y4 and y5. And uh, v just became 1. And we have the same type of inequalities we had before in h. But we no longer have this condition that y4 and y5 have to sum up to 1. Now, this new object actually only lives in a two-dimensional space because we just depends on y4 and y5. So we can draw it in two dimensions quite well. And it looks like this. And we can see that the way the labels touch has not changed. So label 1 touches label 2, and label 2 touches label 3 in one point, but label 1, for example, doesn't touch label 3. The only thing that has changed that there's an additional connection between two labels that wasn't there before. We can see that label 4 and label 5 now touch. Whereas before, these labels corresponded to these parallel lines that would never meet. But because of the projection, we get these artificial points where these parallel lines would theoretically meet in infinity, I suppose. So that's the only difference, and this is a notable difference that we should keep in mind. I'm not so interested in the coordinate system here, and I'm also not so interested in the three-dimensional picture anymore. All we need now is this object Q, and this is the best response polytope for one of the players. We can actually describe this set Q in a more concise way. Uh, when we use vectors and matrices. So it's just all the vectors y for which a times y is less or equal 1 and y is non-negative. And when I write less or equal 1, I mean on the left-hand side we have a vector and on the right there's just a scalar value. But what this means is that each component in this vector on the left side should be less or equal to 1 individually. Okay, so this is the set Q, and in exactly the same way, we don't have to draw this all again, uh, we can do this for the other player. So the corresponding best response polytope for the other player would be described by all vectors x, 
that satisfy that x transpose b, where b is the payoff matrix of player 2, is less or equal 1, and all the x values are non-negative. We can also draw this particular object, p. It's a bit complicated to see what's going on here because it's actually a three-dimensional object. The, the vector x has uh, three components. So you have to picture this in three dimensions. It's sort of a box of sorts where we have one plane 4 that's at the front and then a plane 5 that's a uh, side wall and then there are three more walls which are hidden. One is the horizontal plane that uh, corresponds to the x1, x2 plane. Then we have a left wall which corresponds to the x1, x3 plane and we have a back wall which corresponds to the x2, x3 plane. And because this is a bit difficult to see in three dimensions, we look at a flattened version of this, which is not accurate at all, but maintains all the label neighborhoods quite well. So this is a flattened version of the object at the top. We have this plane 4, this plane 5 right next to it, then we have the back wall which has the label 1 because that's where x1 would be 0. We have the left wall which is where x2 is 0 and so we have that. And then we have the floor of the entire object which is the x1, x2 plane and that has label 3 because there x3 is equal to 0. And I indicate this by putting this label 3 outside of this entire object. The way to think about this is that the label 3 here touches all of the outside edges of this flattened version of this object. Okay, so these are the two best response polytopes corresponding to the two players. The left one is an accurate representation of what the polytope looks like. The right one is not an accurate representation, it's a, it's a flattened two-dimensional version of what actually is a three-dimensional object. And again, what we want to find is a pair of fully labeled points because those correspond to Nash equilibria. So for example, this is a pair that is fully labeled. On the left the point we have the labels 1 and 5, and on the right point we have the labels 2, 4 and 3. Uh, remember that 3 uh, touches all the outside edges, so also the lower left corner of this object. So in total we have all 5 labels, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So this corresponds to a Nash equilibrium. And we have another pair of points that has all the labels. Uh, we have label 3 and label 2 on the left and we have label 1, 5 and 4 on the right. And finally we have a pair of points here that also have all labels. Uh, on the left we have label 4 and 5 and on the right we have labels 1, 2 and 3. Now for this you have to be very careful because this is not actually a Nash equilibrium. Why is that? Can you think of the reason why this is not a Nash equilibrium? Well, it's not a Nash equilibrium or it doesn't correspond to a Nash equilibrium because these points are somewhat artificial. They were only introduced through our projection. They didn't exist in the original object. Remember when I said that labels 4 and 5 do not touch in the original object but through the projection we suddenly get this corner point where these two parallel lines seem to touch. So we have to discount this pair of points that have all labels. All other pairs of points that have all labels correspond to Nash equilibria but this one does not. And this will always be the case when you produce these best response polytopes and in fact it's a useful artifact that the Lemkehausen algorithm will exploit. The idea behind the Lemkehausen algorithm now is to start at this artificial point, so these two points which have all the labels, 
that we know exists because it's just where y4, y5, x1, x2, x3, all of these values are just zero. And then we traverse these best response polytopes step by step to find another pair of points that also has all the labels. So we start with this artificial equilibrium point, which is not really a Nash equilibrium. And then we move through these diagrams, these best response polytopes, until we find a different set of points, which also have all labels. So here's the idea. We start in this artificial point, and then we decide to drop one of the labels. You can drop any you like. In this example, let's say we want to drop label three. That means we want to move in these polytopes to a neighboring point where label three doesn't exist anymore. In this case, uh, the left uh, polytope doesn't even have label three to begin with. So we certainly have to move in the right polytope. And there's only one neighboring vertex in that polytope that doesn't have label three, that doesn't touch label three. We have to move along this edge that divides uh, one and two. And we do this and we end up at a different vertex that doesn't have label three anymore, but that now has label four. Now this is a bit unfortunate because we already had label four covered in the left polytope. So now we have label four twice. We have two copies of label four, but we have no copy at all of label three. What Lemkehausen will try to do is to continue moving in these polytopes until we get label three back. Now, that means, first of all, we want to get rid of one of the two copies of label four. And there are two ways of doing this. The one is to get rid of the copy in the right polytope. But to get rid of label four there, we would have to move back to where we came from. So we wouldn't make any progress. So we don't want to do that. So we have to move in the left polytope instead. And there's only one way to get rid of label four there which is to go to the lower right corner. So we do that and we move to the lower right corner. We don't have label four twice anymore, but we've now picked up a uh, label one in the left polytope. Of course, this is still a problem because now we have label one twice, uh, once in the left polytope and once in the right polytope. And so again, we have to get rid of one copy of label one. And we can't get rid of the copy in the left polytope because that would mean going back to where we came from. So we move in the right polytope instead. So in the right polytope, we now want to get rid of label one. There's only one way of doing this, and that's to go to the lower left corner of this picture. So we move there and we pick a new label up, and that new label is label three, right? We touch the boundary of this picture again, which means uh, we are now next to label three. Well, see there, so we dropped label three in the beginning, we moved around a bit, and now we found label three again. And indeed, if we check, we now have a pair of points that is fully labeled. We have labels one and five in the left polytope, and we have the labels two, four, and three in the right polytope. So that covers all five labels, and therefore we have a fully labeled pair of points, and that corresponds to a Nash equilibrium. So this is exactly what Lemkehausen does. We started by dropping label three, but that was an arbitrary choice. We could have dropped any of the labels. Uh, so for example, we could move back to this starting position and then we could decide to drop label two. So let's try to do that. What happens if we decide to drop label two? Well, we have to get rid of label two. There's only one way of doing this and that's to move in the right polytope to the right. By doing this, we pick up label five now we have two copies of label five and we need to get rid of one of the copies, namely the copy in the left polytope. 
So we move up in the left polytope. That gets rid of label 5, well, one of the copies of label 5, and we pick up label 3 in the left polytope. So we now have two copies of label 3. We need to get rid of the copy in the right polytope, and we do this by moving down and left. By doing this, we pick up label 4. So we have the labels 1, 5, and 4 in the right polytope, and the labels 4 and 3 in the left polytope. So that's not good because we have label 4 twice, and we don't have a copy of label 2. So we need to get rid of one copy of label 4. So in the left polytope, we now move to the right to get rid of label 4. And you can see that we get rid of label 4 and we pick up label 2. And so we started by dropping label 2. We now found label 2 again. And that means we have a pair of fully labeled points. We have labels 2 and 3 in the left polytope and the remaining labels uh, 1, 4, and 5 in the right polytope. So this again corresponds to a Nash equilibrium, and this time we actually reached a different Nash equilibrium than we did the first time. So this works when we start with a fully labeled pair of points, and we have this artificial pair of points that is fully labeled, and so that's where we started. But we don't have to start there. So suppose you already know a Nash equilibrium. Let's pick just uh, one of them that we've already discovered. Then we can actually start this process from there. So we start at this Nash equilibrium we already have, and we decide to drop some label. Say we decide to drop label 3 from that initial position. And again, we just figure out where we want to move. So if we drop label 3, we have to move in the left polytope to get rid of label 3. We move down and to the right, and we pick up label 1. So now we have two copies of label 1. We need to get rid of the copy in the right polytope. So we move to the lower right corner of that polytope, and we pick up label 3 again. So this was a quite quick process. We dropped label 3. After just two moves, we found label 3 again. And so we found another pair of points that is fully labeled. And so this is another Nash equilibrium. So I hope this gave you an idea on how you move around in these polytopes and dropping and finding labels. And I claim that this process, this type of algorithm, always terminates. So it always succeeds in finding a Nash equilibrium eventually. And the reason is that everything we do is basically unique. So the starting edge, our starting move, is unique once we decide which label to drop first. And then each continuation is also unique. You will have noticed that we alternate between the two polytopes, and the move we make is always unique. We have to get rid of the copy of a label that we have twice, and always leaves us only with one option of where to go. Essentially, we are just following a simple path, and so this simple path must have one endpoint that we eventually reach. This is the idea behind Lemkehausen's algorithm. There's only one piece missing. So the remaining problem is that we cannot actually draw these polytopes and then move around in them. And the reason is that these polytopes are quite large. They might have exponential number of corners. So we don't want to draw them first and then just move around in them. Instead, we want some algebraic way of traversing these polytopes without actually completely constructing them up front. And this is what the last video about Lemkehausen's algorithm will be about.